Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dad was an artist, and uh, he took me out one time. We were living in Dallas, which is where I was born, and he took me out one day to paint watercolors with him, which was unusual. He was not uh, an altogether patient man, and um, I was rather surprised but delighted. So one of my fondest memories from when I was maybe eight or nine years old was when he and I drove over to what's called a levee, a big embankment that overlooked the Trinity River, which cuts right through downtown Dallas, and uh, proceeded to try to apply watercolor to paper. And so he was giving me a few pointers from time to time, although, again, he wasn't uh, uh, all that keen on fiddling with me, but rather wanting, trying to get his own work done. Something I, I think anybody who's a parent and is also an artist can appreciate. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, we worked for a while. And then after a bit, he said, OK, I think it's lunchtime. Let's go get some lunch. So we hopped in this car and drove some distance down the road to a place that he always seemed to know where to go to find these things. There was this little roadside shack where they made fabulous fried chicken run by a couple. And we pulled over, got some fried chicken, took it out onto a picnic bench out there uh, by, beside the shack, right by the road. And uh, along with the chicken, they gave us some fabulous biscuits and honey. And I just remember that like it was yesterday. <laughs> but throughout my childhood, actually, the smell of oil paint was around. These days, we know some of that's not so great. You know, like turpentine? No, not now. But in those days, uh, it was a common fragrance, if you will. I love the, still love the smell of turpentine um, throughout the house. And uh, as he was trying to oh, do a portrait of my mother or things like that. So I think that's. Uh, that's kind of how it all started. Um, you like to blame your parents for something, you know. <laughs> uh, he was not keen on my getting into anything having to do with art. I actually left MIT midway through my junior year. Uh, was in art school for a year and a half back in Dallas, living on the second floor of an antique shop, and uh, made my w living by working in a frame shop where we carved hand-carved frames and did gilding and things like that. <clears throat> it was an interesting period of my life. I said something at one point about how I thought I'd like to go to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. And my mother and father, who gotten divorced in the meantime, did manage to come together on this one issue. Uh, it was like a little mini atomic bomb going off in the family. <laughs> and uh, the idea was, I think, well, what you, a lot of you know, guilt really works well sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, and uh, they said, well, look, we've already spent all this money getting you through two and a half years at MIT. You go back and finish up, and then you can do whatever the heck you want. That was the message. So I wound up doing that. Fortunately for me, when I got back to MIT, they had uh, uh, done a lot of headhunting. They brought a lot of uh, terrific people in humanities from all over the place, in linguistics, in philosophy, languages, and so forth. And so uh, I recall that there was one, there were one or two, two things I still had to take in physics. One uh, horrible um, uh, course in quantum mechanics, uh, and another one in lab science, which I on blowing glass Not anymore. but. Uh, uh, that was interesting, but mostly it was fun to be able to take some classes in the humanities. I took several courses in philosophy. There was a man there, Irving Singer, who became kind of like anything I could that he taught. He also and 
wonderful. Um, uh, but I went on to work at, for a while at the M MIT Instrumentation Laboratory. We were doing work on guidance systems, of all things. Uh, but in the evenings, I'd go to the School of the Museum of Fine Arts. And so the guys in, at the uh, instrumentation lab would say, I'm sorry, you do what in the evening? <laughs> and the people over at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts would say, you do what in the daytime? <laughs> so there's this kind of perennial schizophrenia I apply to myself that uh, uh, I've become quite comfortable with. <laughs> anyway, but uh, that's enough about me, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> Anybody have any questions right now? I should mention that um, you're going to have ample opportunity to ask, ask me a few questions, of course. But then I know there's a ringer in the audience here who is going to be back visiting with you in February. She's a wonderful pastel artist, Jean Rosier Smith. Wonderful teacher, wonderful pastel artist. And so I imagine that Jean could also answer all sorts of questions that I couldn't. but. Uh, yeah, please stand up, Jean. You'll, <coughs> you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll see her again in February. So do come for that demo that she's doing. So uh, nobody has any questions about pastels. Well, we could go home. Oh, no. How did you end up in pastels? How did I end up in it? Well, it, in some ways, it seems like a very natural kind of medium. As soon as you draw, well, if you just simply take whatever you're drawing with, and grab a pastel and stick it in your hand, you're using a pastel. I mean, and one of the things I think that most uh, pastel artists I know uh, love about it is that immediacy. That, uh, in a way, it's utterly simple on the surface of it. Uh, and that, uh, that act of sort of drawing. I'll have a little quote later, I think, from T Wayne Thiebaud, who one of my favorite artists. and. Uh, he was drawn to pastel very much for the same reason, I think. It's that act of drawing that is so uh, enticing. Um, Jean, yes. Sure. Do you remember when you first started working with pastel? It's only been recently that pastel has become more popular. Yeah, yeah. Among artists again. Yeah. Oh, well, the first two things. When, when did I start using pastels? And then what kind of pastels did I use at that point? And I think the uh, immediate answer, I think, as to what kind I used, I think I was just using new pastels. Um, some of them are, I don't know how light set, how permanent they are. Some of them are, some of them aren't. But, uh, but they were ready to hand, easily uh, obtainable from art stores. Um, there was something about the way they worked that resem resembled something I was quite familiar with, which is a, a black crayon called Conte crayon, which is ubiquitous in all the art schools. It's just one of the tools you, everybody uses. Um, those also come in a couple of different colors. But the new pastels were similar in nature. They looked a little bit like a, uh, a Conte crayon. Uh, just grab, you know, I'd see a set, a little set of pastels in an art store someplace. There was one Johnson paint, which unfortunately, I don't, I see some head shaking. But, uh, there was a guy there who knew more about brush than anybody I ever met in my life. Sadly, about three years ago, they stopped selling art supplies, but they can't compete with the likes of Blick and so on, I guess. Uh, so probably when I was, I don't think I ever used them back when I was in um, too much into oil painting at that point. But I think when I went, was going to the new school, that's when I was able to find them easily and, and trying out things with them. Yes? Right. Right, yeah. Or paper that's mounted. Uh, are there problems with that in terms of getting the pastel to the right 
-hmm. Well, actually, um, the uh, you were talking about these sanded surfaces that have come, become very uh, widely available from several manufacturers now. They were actually available in uh, things like that were available in the 19th century. Yeah, and in fact, unfortunately, if you go to the museum right now and look at that show, the beautiful Mary Cassatt pastel that they had in there, they've moved to the American wing, so you'd have to go in search of it. That's on sand and paper. Yeah. However, in the show uh, as it is right now, uh, there's a, uh, a marvelous evocative landscape that's on a kind of um, not even sanded paper. It looks like it's they they made the surface with what might have been swept up off of a carpenter's floor or something. Is there pieces of wood in it? All sorts of grit and st very st strange things. Uh, Care Xavier Roussel, uh, I believe, is the artist uh, who did that. Um, it's a little hard to see in the gallery there, but that seems to be holding up quite well. The nice thing today, I think, is that we've come through a period the last many decades when people began to understand uh, what's required in order for paper to last. Um, acidity in paper, alum rosin sizing, all those things people gradually realized that was bad and did not help the longevity of the paper that people were using. Uh, I'll touch on that a little bit in conjunction with one of the millets. I'll show you a little bit. But uh, today, most manufacturers that I'm familiar with, anyway, talk about how they use an acid-free substrate, the basic paper, which is all to the good. So I haven't seen any sort of so-called aging studies of these, but I'm optimistic. So. OK, well, yeah, I guess. Why don't we do some more questions after I finish my palaver? <laughs> OK, all right. <clears throat> Well, welcome again. Uh, and thank you very much, Dottie, and thank you, Wellesley Society of Artists, for inviting me here. Uh, it's just It's great fun to be here. And uh, I'm, I'm glad so many of you came out on this cold, cold evening to uh, listen in on this. Um, I worked at the Museum of Fine Arts, as Dottie said, for nearly 40 years as a conservator of works of art on paper, or as I might say, an art doctor. I had to do meticulous examination of my patients, which meant that I often had to look at them naked. <laughs> of the artworks, uh, not me. <laughs> when you get to see works on paper out of their frames, you can see things that aren't readily visible to the usual museum visitor. And this evening, I'd like to share with you some of the things that I've seen. My talk this evening is geared, of course, toward the current exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts. For instance, French Pastel's Treasures from the Vault. So when you visit that show, you can wow your friends with your in-depth expertise about those gorgeous pictures. I've got a lot to show you, so if you have questions, please remember them, and there will be time afterward to, uh, to answer, try to answer them. Well, what are pastel pictures anyway? Works in pastel hover, as I suggested a moment ago, somewhere between drawing and painting because you hold a stick of pastel in your hand, not a brush loaded with paint, the medium is capable of graphic linear mark making, as in this pa painting by Liz Haywood Sullivan. As well as lush painterly effect effects, here's a colleague by my colleague, uh, a painting by my colleague, Jean Rosier Smith. Thank you, Jean, for making this beautiful painting. <laughs> but as those of you who have used the medium know, it can be deceptive. The colorful sticks seem so simple to use, but the powdery surface can be difficult to layer and secure in place. One of its great appeals, though, is its immediacy. No mixing of paint is necessary. Just pick up a stick and make your marks. During the late 19th century, avant-garde artists whoops, uh, in France and beyond took up pastels to capture the here and now, fleeting facial expressions, or passing effects of light or weather, and delicate 
blossoms that might soon wither, as in this painting by Millet in the MFA show. Pastels were perfectly suited to this aim, a seemingly evanescent medium for an evanescent subject. A French critic at the time noted, that's the triumph of this technique. It must capture what is most elusive. Another 19th century critic wrote, pastel has a great advantage over painting. The crayon moves as rapidly as inspiration itself. An idea that would take a painter six months of labor would be completed by a pastelist in just a few hours. Well, that may overstate it a little bit, but anyway. <laughs> Let me share a personal story to illustrate this aspect of pastel. Here is a view of a cottage on a promontory of an island in Booth Bay Harbor. My family and I were staying at a friend's house on the island, and one evening as we sat on the porch, which faced west, we saw an astounding sunset, a sunset rather like this one, over the mainland. I vowed to have my pastels ready the next evening in case we might be treated to a repeat of this beautiful scene. I was in luck. I got my easel all set up, and just after dinner it was apparent that another amazing sunset would occur. When the moment came, I dashed to the easel and began work. But almost immediately, I had company. Swarms of mosquitoes descended on me. <laughs> Our daughter-in-law called out from the house to ask how things were going. So I shouted, bring the mosquito spray. <laughs> Plucking pastels from the box while spraying clouds of mosquitoes, the mosquito repellent was a challenge. After only 15 minutes, the light began to fail and I just had to stop. I suppose that when it gets to the point where you can't distinguish one pastel from another, another, you just have to declare the painting finished. Well, occasionally, artists combine pastel with other media like charcoal, printer's ink, or paint in a single work, and you'll see examples of this in the show. Others take advantage of its inherent qualities, its velvety or granite, granular texture, for example, to uh, create dazzling effects. The kind of surface an artist selects can also have a huge influence on pastel painting, as we'll see later. Some practitioners applied liquid, water, or alcohol to strokes of pastel so that it behaves almost like a paint. Here, for example, you see how a brush wetted with water can, in effect, dissolve and spread a stroke of pastel. Here's another example of how pastel can be manipulated. If moistened with a spray of ordinary rubbing alcohol, this area of dark blue-gray pastel strokes can be spread so as to cover an area of the paper as if you were using a liquid medium. All in all, pastel is a wonderfully versatile medium. Recently, there was a show in New York of drawings, watercolors, and pastels by Wayne Thiebaud, whose work I love. In an interview, Timo, ex Timo explained why he loves pastel. I was attracted to pastel because of Degas. It's a kind of pure medium in a way. You can put just a big gob of beautiful pigment, cobalt, or whatever on your painting. I find it one of the most direct mediums. I'm glad that Timo praised Degas' pastels, and I'll be showing you several later on. Well, so much for my sales pitch on the wonders of the pastel medium. Let's look at how they are made. Some artists and craftspeople have gotten into making their own pastels, but most artists prefer to spend their time making paintings instead of pastels and will rely on one or more commercial makers. I've got a few copies of a handout from Dakota Pastel's website listing most of the major manufacturers listed by the comparative softness or hardness of the pastels. You might like to take a look. Now, in this short video by the Schenker Company in Germany, it gives you a good idea of the way machine-made pastels are produced. Schminke pastels are very video. soft. Some even say they are as smooth as silk Reminds and velvet. Today, I would like to show you the sophisticated the manufacturing process of our 400 their extra their orders, soft pastels. Hello, my name is Markus Baumgart, and I'm responsible for sales and I'm not sure you can hear that. When we have visitors from around the world, and two of them are our production site, they are particularly amazed at how we produce our pastels. To achieve this extra softness, 
it requires a very, very high amount of pure pigment. But it's also due to the handmade process of producing them. Please join me for a quick tour. Schminke pastels contain only pure pigment in the highest concentration and just a minimum of binding agent, which just ensures that they form a stable compound. They do not contain any chalk. This is what makes them unique. And that's also the reason why we call them pastel sticks and not pastel crayons. These are pure pastels without any additives. With this very high pigment content, you are more or less at the origin of color. The special recipe requires a special handling of the pastels. I would like to introduce you my colleague Pia Schröder, who is responsible for this process. The first step is the molding of the pastel sticks. Here you can see how Pia takes the pastels out from the warm extruders and puts them onto the pallet. Finally, they need to be cut with a wire strung frame. After they have been cut, Pia puts them on the wooden pallet. Now the pastels have to dry for about two weeks at room temperature. Also, they have the same length and diameter. They all are slightly different when you look close at them. That is a result of the handmade process. One thing, however, they have in common. This is when you just touch them, you have the pure pigment at your hand. This is the result of the high concentration of pigments. The 400 pastels are classified into rows and each of the pastels has its own label. Here you can find the color name, the number and the grade of graduation. The letters B, D, H, M and O indicate the five different grades of graduation. D is always the sign for the pure color. B stands for the black graduation and the three white graduations can be identified by the letters H, M, and O. This softness requires the next manufacturing process, the labeling by hand. Our colleagues must be very careful when labeling the sticks, otherwise they could possibly break. Due to the softness and the individual handmade shapes, an automatic labeling of these pastels is not possible at all. Finally, these pastels are put into foam material inlays so that they can be delivered safely into the art material shops around the world, even to Australia. I really hope I was able to give you a little insight in how we produce our finest soft pastels. It is my experience that artists around the world like them for their color strength, their softness, and also for the wide selection with more than 400 pastels that are available. By the way, they are produced for more than 100 years, made in Germany and also in the future. Now I would like to wish you a lot of joy using them. <laughs> it does kind of remind me of some of those car commercials you see, you know, <laughs> very uncomfortable and so forth. But anyway, well, I think that's kind of interesting, even though it's a, obviously a commercial pitch. Um, ask any p artist who uses pastels, though, whether they have enough, and they'll probably say no. <laughs> but if you have a lot of them, the problem then becomes how to organize them. 19 years ago, a friend of the Museum of Fine Arts donated a box of pastels that once belonged to Mary Cassatt, and it's in the exhibition, so do take a look at it. Judging by the stamp on the lid of that box, the pastels came from Moulard, makers and merchants of high quality pigments whose shop at 8 Rue de Pigalle in Paris was frequented by many of the Impressionists. Renoir's son recalls seeing, seeing a dozen or so young women hand grinding pigments there. The box has got two tiers so that it can hold a decent number of pastels. In Cassatt's box, pastels are organized by color, some still new and others worn down to nubs. Degas, too, sorted his pastels by color, although he stored his in a cigar box. The exhibition of the museum's pastels brings together some terrific pastel paintings by some superb artists, such as Degas, Manet, Pizarro, Monet, and Fritz Thalo. 
Who? <laughs> Wait, Fritz who? Who the heck is he? Well, John, or Johann, rather, Friedrich uh, Thalo was born in Norway, the son of a wealthy chemist. Educated at the Academy of Art in Copenhagen, he eventually became one of the leading young artists in Norway. But he moved to France in 1892 and was caught up in the art scene there. And a great place to begin our virtual tour of the pastel show is by looking at his farmyard in the snow. Thalo took up pastel primarily in the 1890s, utilizing the versatile medium to depict river views, nocturnal effects, and wintry scenes of his native Norway. This view may depict a farm where Thalo lived for many years in the mid-1880s. The soft granular pigment beautifully captures the feathery snow blowing off the edges of the barn's roof. Well, this is a guy who really understood pastel and how to use its inherent character. Just look at how he expressed the powdery snow blowing off the roof at the right of the painting. And look especially at how he captured the effect of snow billowing off the roof at the left. He just dragged a stick of pastel or perhaps brushed some of the powdery pastel across the canvas to create the necessary effect. Did I say canvas? Yes. This painting is on canvas. When you visit the exhibition, do look at this pastel to, by Thalo right next to Farmyard in Winter. Here is Cottages in Snow. Look closely at the right side of the painting, and you can see the texture of the canvas itself on which he did the painting. Canvas may seem like a very odd choice for pastel instead of using paper, but prepared canvas of the sort that an artist could use for an oil painting has quite enough texture to be a receptive surface for pastel. By the way, at the other side of the gallery, you'll see Manet's portrait of Mesrois, which is also on canvas. Well, now let's look at Jean-Francois Millet. Millet. I keep making that mistake. He wanted to keep saying Millet, but it actually is Millet. Uh, who in many ways is the spring from which rivers of pastel flowed in the 19th century, which explains why in the exhibition you'll see 14 of these, his, marvelous, his marvelous works in pastel. After Millet died in 1875, 95 of his pastel paintings went to auction in an exhibition in Paris, and 12 of those are on view in the MFA's show. Upon seeing the works in 1875, a young artist named, some guy named Vincent Van Gogh, <laughs> wrote to his brother Theo saying, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thy standest is holy ground. In other words, he really liked the show. <laughs> well, Millet's luminous, evocative pastels of shepherds, farmyards, and country themes employed the medium to wholly new effect. In Farmyard in Winter, Delicate wisps of freshly fallen snow still cling to branches that extend across the top of the win this wintry view. The powderiness of the medium harmonizes with the powdery snow it portrays. Poultry huddle together under the shelter of a rustic enclosure. A bright red robin perched toward the left end draws our attention to the unexpected richness of colors. Gentle tones of blue, beige, and brown sketch out the snow-covered ground, while green, blue, and orange hues outline the crumbling rock wall at center. In the distance, smoke rises from the chimneys of a farmhouse. Now, this is interesting here, too. This, if you look here, you begin to see in that area some scratches Millet was actually scratching into his picture in order to articulate some of the coarse texture of the, uh, the grass and the stubble that the uh, chicken is pecking around in. And also here, there are individual strokes of pastel, very direct and clear, to show the bundle of sticks lying on the ground with birds perched on top of them. You can practically count the strokes of pastel. Let's look back for a moment at that painting by Thalo, which was done 23 years later than Millet's. 
I'm wondering how you compare that, or if you might compare that, we can talk about this later, uh, with Millet's version of it. In some ways, I would submit that Millet's is more, has more sense of a sympathy or empathy with his subject, but it's, uh, they're both really quite amazing. Well, now switching as is rather nice this time of year from nothing but snow, 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 Let's go over to something like this. Remember spring? Remember summer? <laughs> In this dense enclosure of lush green foliage, dandelions play out their life cycle. Some closed, one with its full yellow face open, a cluster turned downy, their white orbs coming apart as seeds scatter. Covering the entire sheet with pastel, Millet pays exquisite attention to naturalistic detail, conjuring a sensation of being outdoors transfixed by the beauty and abundance of nature. He imbues each stem with a sense of life. This is one of my favorite details, showing how just a few shafts of sunlight penetrate the dense foliage and highlight delicate white flowers. You can practically count the strokes of pastel in this as well. And notice there are numerous black strokes here, some probably black Conti crayon, used to define the contours of the leaves and accentuate the blades of grass. Well, there are far more wonderful Millet pastels in the gallery than I have time to share with you, so please do go and enjoy them when you, yourself. But before we leave Millet, let me mention something that may surprise you. In the upper left of this picture, two men turning over the soil, a large amount of the paper is actually bare. There is virtually no pastel. This goes back to the question you asked earlier about the nature of the paper that people use today. And unfortunately, in Millet's time, some of the paper wasn't as good. I find that most people, when they look at this, simply accept that the color of this bare paper is the same as it was when Millet did the painting. Well, now, those of you who are involved with art making, however, may find yourself wondering whether the value relationship, the contrast between the lights and darks, between this area and the nearby clouds and the smoke from the fires in the fields near the horizon is correct. It is not. It turns out that the paper has darkened somewhat due to chemical reactions exacerbated by exposure to light. Which is rather sad, there's nothing that can be done about that. Well now, turning to Camille Pizarro, his experimental and innovative use of pastel, like that of his friend Degas, modernized and revitalized the medium. In this painting, which, by the way, was once owned by his friend Monet, Pizarro does something quite unusual and untraditional. For much of it, he used tempera paint, which is paint in which pigments are mixed with dilute glue. This medium was often used for painting scenery flats for the theater, but he pushed the envelope by actually combining tempera paint with crushed pastel. If you examine closely the texture of the painting, you can see what I'm talking about. Look, for example, at the head of the woman wearing a white cap toward the right of the painting. You can see lots of tiny lumps and bumps, which are the result of having mixed coarse bits of pastel into the tempera paint. It's almost as if Pizarro had mixed sand into his paint. And look at this, a curious chunk of what was probably a little piece of a green stick of pastel that the artist ground up and threw into his paint. Those of you who are artists might find it interesting to try this idea. In my limited time, I can't talk about every one of the pastels in the show, but please do go gaze at this marvelous still life by Riddle. As Katie Hansen, the curator of the show, says, the artist nimbly combined freewheeling imagination with deep scientific knowledge, reading theory, and maintaining close friendships with botanists and chemists. Here he renders the familiar strange, cut flowers burst from a dark green vase which hovers in an ambiguous space tinged with yellow and blue. The artist described his bouquets as, quote, 
the confluence of two streams, one of representation, the other of memory. And just look at the individual strokes all throughout the background here, the, the blue strokes and sort of a blue-gray, and then there's strokes of sort of a, a off-white here. Uh, again, that, that act of drawing, drawing, drawing strokes is relevant here. The colors in this piece will almost make you swoon. Just look at this detail with its riot of pink, purple, spring green, and intense blues. And pay attention to the kind of paper he used. Its rough texture would have almost grabbed the color off a stick of pastel. Well, here you can really see how the pastel interacts with the roughness of the paper as Redon lightly drew strokes of blue-gray over the background. And notice how he used a fairly sharp point, probably of black Conte crayon, oh, freely over the white flowers and contours of the leaves. This will probably strike a chord if you think back on the work of Millet. Now we absolutely must look at this small but exquisite pastel by Monet, one of two in the show. I'm curious to know how many of you have ever seen a pastel by Monet. Hardly anybody. His pastels and drawings are not nearly as well known as his oil paintings, but they are simply fabulous. A little over 10 years ago, there was an amazing exhibition of his work, works on paper at the Clark Art Museum, Art Institute in Williamstown. And I highly recommend the catalog of that show, which is still available. Well, in 1874, Monet contributed seven pastels, all simply entitled Sketch or Coquille, to the first of what became known as the Impressionist exhibitions. Thus, at the very beginning of that group of artists, he became the artist most closely associated with the medium of pastel, though that designation would soon pass to Degas. There are two of his pastels in the show, and they date from an early moment in Monet's career, reflecting the influence of his mentor, Eugène Boudin. The two artists met around 1858. Monet was only 18 years old. In fact, Boudin was painting around the La Havre area near the mouth of the Seine, where it empties into the Atlantic. And he came upon Monet doing caricatures of passers-by and tourists. And Boudin is thought to have said, hey, kid, you know, you're pretty good. <laughs> you ought to come and work with me a little bit, uh, which he did, and was enormously influenced by, by, the, by Boudin. And the older artist encouraged Monet to paint en plein air in the out of doors in order to study the nuanced effects of natural light. Requiring little setup or drawing time, pastel, again, was an efficient medium to use in that context. Monet captures a fleeting vision of sunset as the last rays of light glow through lavender clouds, the sun already beneath the horizon. Monet thickly covered the surface here with heavily applied strokes of pastel marked by a sense of spontaneity in the bold purple, pink, and orange strokes across the sky. Note areas in the upper corners where brush strokes are available. Those are brush strokes you see up there, indicating he certainly manipulated some of the pastel with perhaps water and a brush. Well, you could say that the icing on the pastel show is some beautiful works by Degas, whose name often seems synonymous with pastel. But given that this work is almost monochromatic, you might wonder why on earth it's in the show. I'm delighted that it is, because it gives me a chance to share with you something quite remarkable about Degas' working methods. Sometimes Degas would do a charcoal drawing on what might seem to be an unusual kind of paper, tracing paper. Then, as in this instance, he would hand over the drawing to a framer he knew, a Père Lezin, to have him mount the drawing on cardboard to produce a firm, rigid surface on which to continue working, as you see here, where he has added some strokes of green and red pastel. Well, I invite you, when you go into the exhibition, to have a very close look at this picture. 
even with the soft lighting in the gallery, if you look closely just to the right of center toward the upper edge, you'll see some blisters where the tracing paper didn't get completely attached to the backboard. This confirms that the picture is done on thin tracing paper. Why do you suppose Degas used this unorthodox way of working? He had a very good reason. He could lay the tracing paper on top of his other drawings or even on an oil painting. He might, for example, lay the thin translucent paper on top of a drawing like this one. Then he could transfer that traced drawing to a new composition, such as this one on the right, where Degas has replicated the drawing and incorporated it into an entirely new painting. Very clever, very clever. <laughs> I think you can see that Degas loved this way of inventing, that he loved this way of inventing new compositions. In effect, by recycling and recombining portions of other paintings. This reminds me of one of my favorite quotes by Degas. Someone once asked him, Monsieur Degas, how is it that you arrive at your compositions? Degas replied, composition, monsieur, is like committing the perfect crime. <laughs> In other words, though you may succeed, no one knows how. <laughs> OK, time for some fireworks. Here is one of the great masterpieces in the Museum of Fine Arts. It's called Dancers in Rows. That's R-O-S-E, not R-O-W-S. And it would be the centerpiece in any exhibition of pastels. And it holds some, unre some remarkable secrets. One clue to the secrets is that you'll notice how similar the two dancers on the right are. Here, Degas is probably working, once again, on a perfect crime. In effect, he's duplicated one of the figures, shifting her position to just behind the other. This is essentially the same as this. With some differences, of course. He's given the two dancers a different hair color, for example. You can find another clue if you look very closely near the, mod near the bottom edge of the picture, near the heel of the dancer. Zooming in on that detail, notice that there's a kind of horizontal break in the picture. This turns out to be a seam between the tracing paper above the break and another strip of tracing paper at the bottom. In fact, if you look carefully at the other sides, you'll discover that additional strips of paper were added to all four sides. Aha, now the mystery becomes clear. Degas did a charcoal drawing on a large sheet of tracing paper, perhaps using the tracing paper to replicate some of the figures and combine them into a new composition. Then he sent that large drawing to his framer, saying he wanted Monsieur Lezin to enlarge the drawing by adding strips of paper to all four sides. This would give Degas more room to carry out what he envisioned as his eventual composition. You see, the, that's, I've outlined here where those joins are. They're kind of hard to see in the gallery, but if you look very, very carefully, you'll see them. By the way, if you were to look at this painting under the microscope, as I've had the privilege of doing, you'd see that Degas used liberal amounts of fixative to hold the pastels, uh, pastel particles firmly in place. When looking at it this way, I thought it was like looking at tiny, brilliantly colored jewels scattered all over. Incidentally, here's a little bit of insider info you can pull out at your next cocktail party or the next time you want to impress somebody with your expertise about art. If you look at the lower left corner of Dancers in Rose, you'll see Degas' signature written in red pastel. But by comparison, on another pastel in the show, it's got this at the bottom. Look at this carefully, and you'll see that there are slight indentations in the paper at the upper left above the D and in the middle at the bottom of the G. This indicates it's not actually Degas' signature, but is indeed a stamp. After Degas' death, the contents of his studio were auctioned at the famous Hotel Drouot in Paris. This red stamp was applied to all the pastels and drawings in the sale. So 
If you see this stamp on the next Degas you're thinking of buying, it's not Degas' signature. It just means that it was in his studio when he died. Well, let's look at one more pastel by Degas that has a little bit of everything. First, it's done on three separate sheets of paper. In this case, it's regular paper, not tracing paper. See if you can spot the joins when you look at this in the gallery. One of them is kind of vertically right along there. It's hard to use the, the uh, laser pointer to outline that exactly. Second, there are a number of places where Degas wetted the pastel. That chocolate brown edge of the bench the dancer is sitting on right here is uh, probably painted wet with a brush, maybe with a wet mixture of various ground up pastels to make that chocolate brown color. If you were to look at this under a microscope, you'd be amazed how many multicolor particles of ground up pastel there are. This is reminiscent of Pizarro's painting that we saw earlier. The molding at the bottom of the wall in the far end of the room was also done with that same uh, paint-like mixture. And if you look at the lower left quarter of the painting, you'll realize that Degas used a wet brush to blend, manipulate, and modulate the various layers of subtle colors. The wall at the top of the picture has been darkened with a light wash of color. That's up here. Perhaps also made with diluted pastel. He also used these washes of color down here in part to conceal a line, not most, but almost all of a line that formerly represented a join in the floor. Let's see if I can find it. It's right in here. It's kind of, oh yeah, there it is. There it is. But if you look at that line, a join in the floor, you can see quickly it doesn't really line up with the other joins in the floor he's uh, indicated elsewhere. So you can see why he edited that out, as it were. This painting is certainly one of my favorites. And it is even more delightful to see it in its new frame. Yes, it's just been reframed, and you will be among the very first people to see it in its new clothes. Here is its, it is in its former frame, which it's lived in for many years. Gold frames like this have been the mainstay of the style used in the art market for Impressionist paintings. But some time ago, the museum's terrific, terrific conservator of frames, Andrew Haynes, made an inventory of all the frames in the collection, whether empty or not. One of the empty frames looked very much like the kind of frame Degas is known to have designed for his pastel paintings. And it was almost the right size and aesthetic. But careful measurements revealed that it could not have been in its, its original frame. On the other hand, this precipitated a fruitful discussion with the curator, Katie Hansen. She asked Andrew to create a new frame based on research that has been done on Degas' frames and on a drawing in one of Degas' own notebooks. Here's a close-up of the molding of the new frame. You can see that three grooves have been carved into the front edge, and each groove has been gilded. Then the contour of the frame drops back to a wide, flat area, ending in a bevel edge up here around the opening for the picture. One of the museum's preparators, John Thornton, fitted the new frame with a special glass that has an anti-reflective and UV blocking coating. So the reflections you saw with the former frame are no longer a problem. Cleaning that special new glass can be challenging, <laughs> as you can tell from the intense expression on the face of my colleague Annette Manning, the head of the paper conservation lab. Well, here is the naked pastel itself lying in its protective box where it lay after being removed from the former frame until it could be reframed in the new one. Finally, the pastel is lifted gently into its new frame. Don't breathe. Then it will be sealed carefully to prevent dust and so forth from getting into the frame. So here it is now, as you'll see it in the show, looking very much, I must say, as Degas himself would have liked it. Quite a change. 
Well, finally, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about two of my very favorite objects in the Museum of Fine Arts. Years ago, when I came to Boston for college and began frequenting the Museum of Fine Arts, I soon fell in love with this picture by Degas and this one. I don't know why I was so enthralled by these two pictures, but they are beautiful. After looking at them long and hard, I would try to see if I could somehow replicate at least some of the effects that Degas had achieved. No matter what I would do, I could not achieve the painterly effects I saw in these pictures. Well, in 1968, a young art historian at Harvard, Eugenia Janus, did some groundbreaking research on these and other related pictures by Degas. She showed that they are a kind of hybrid, a combination of something called monotype, on top of which the artist added pastel. Well, what is a monotype? In many ways, it's the simplest of all printmaking techniques. You don't need acids, as with etching, nor do you need the chem tricky chemistry involved in lithography. All you need to do is to make a painting with some printing ink or oil paint on a flat surface, which could be a metal plate, which is what Degas used. Although today, artists can even use plexiglass. Then you lay a sheet of paper on top of the ink or paint and press it down. When you lift up the paper, much of your painting will have transferred to the paper. Let's have a look at how this works. My friend Phyllis McGibbon, who's one of the professors in the art department at Wellesley College, helped me do this uh, to a little, uh, series, series of images here uh, for your edification. Well, here's a sheet of clear plexiglass on which I've sat, sl simply slathered some reddish brown printing ink. Here is that inked plexiglass being placed on a bed of a printing press such as one uses for printing etchings. Then, a sheet of, trace of a sheet of printing paper is placed on top of that inked plate, then a piece of clean waste paper to keep the woolen printing felt clean. Here comes the felt. That felt acts as a cushion between the large cylindrical roller, which exerts tremendous pressure on the art you are printing. Now the felt and the waste paper are peeled up and then voila, your monotype. As you can see, much of the ink gets transferred to the paper, which is why this is called a monotype. But sometimes Degas would run the plate through again to make another print from the leftover ink. These are often called ghost images. And this would, of course, be noticeably weaker than the first one. Here, for example, at the Metropolitan Museum of New York in, or in New York is such a ghost image, which he made after the one at the Museum of Fine Arts. In both cases, Degas would work over each of the monotypes with pastel, transforming the color scheme of each paper, of each, each picture. But when you compare them, as we can here, it's fascinating to see that even with the underlying compositional similarities, each is in many respects a different picture. Go back to the, the, the MFA version, which you'll see in the show. Quite a fascinating comparison to see the differences between them, but similarities. The story of how he came to do them is fascinating. The 56-year-old Degas and an artist friend, Bartolome, traveled by two-wheeled carriage from Paris, some 200 miles southeast to DNA, to visit another artist friend who had a printing press. It was there that Degas began to make monotypes, astonishing Bartolome, who said, as Degas started drawing landscapes from memory, it was as if they were still in front of his eyes, even though he hadn't once stopped to take a closer look, unquote. This is a testimony to Degas' belief that an artist should try to develop one's memory as an aid in producing art. Well, 
we're at the end of our own journey, but let's just take one last look at these two remarkable examples of the work of an artist whose understanding of and prowess in the medium, medium of pastel remains unsurpassed. Thank you. We have time for questions, if anybody has some. Yes? Question, what kind of camera equipment did I use to take many of these pictures? Uh, most, the ones with Olympus uh, digital camera. Yeah, pretty amazing. <laughs> I have a Nikon, but it's much more unwieldy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, uh, if pastels have been properly selected by the artist and are light fast, they could last forever, really last forever. I mean, it's just, uh, obviously, if you were to take one out of its frame and do something like try to dust it off, that would be disastrous. Uh, but uh, otherwise, they're, they're good to go. It's just, uh, it's just one of the, is an incredibly permanent medium. In fact, years ago, we did an exhibition at the uh, museum uh, in which we hauled out, well, not all, but a tremendous number of works by Millet. The Museum of Fine Arts actually has the largest collection of Millet anywhere in the world, including in France. And in that exhibition, some years back, we had both paintings, oil paintings and pastels, over and over again, people kept saying, I really love the pastels. You know, the, the freshness of the color, whereas the oil paintings sometimes tended, some of the, partly it's the oil, partly it's the varnish, you know, can sort of change over time. But the pastels, they look great, yeah. Uh, the paper is a key thing. As I mentioned, Degas didn't, I mean, uh, uh, Millet didn't realize in his day, as artists simply didn't, that uh, there were some inherent problems with the paper that was being produced then. And so that the uh, paper in that picture of two men turning over the soil, for example, sadly has darkened. But it's also one of the reasons why they don't have that on view all the time, to try to maintain it in the same shape it's in right now for posterity. When I was in charge of the paper conservation lab, I used to like to say, my job is really trying to make things stay as fresh looking for my grandchildren as they are for me. Yes? So, um, about which? The Millet, two men over, turning over the soil? Yes. Yeah. Well, what's your question? Sometimes the, the question is, can you tell what the original color was? Occasionally, you may find little bits of the paper around the edges that have been protected from light, and that may give you a clue. That happens a lot in my field. You, know, you can often, once you've got something unframed, you'll often see, as actually with one or two Millets in the show, oh my gosh, this was blue-green, not brown, which can be kind of shocking. Yeah. Is there ever a process? No. Is there a bleaching process? No, unfortunately not. I mean, you destroy the picture. Yeah, uh, it's it, you're very limited in what you can do with something like that. So we tend to emphasize trying to give it the benefit of proper preservation. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, I often envy my, my friends in the paintings conservation field. 
there's no, nothing like a badly discolored varnish one could remove from a painting to restore, to, to or, or reveal what the colors might have been. So it's, there's really, to my knowledge, there's really nothing one can do uh, with um, trying to uh, ameliorate things like that discoloration in the Millet. I wish it were possible, but I simply, at this point, I don't know of anyone who's ever figured out some technique that could do that safely. So unfortunately, mostly it's, it comes back to the idea of trying to give it the benefit of protection, blocking ultraviolet light, which is very harmful and can cause color changes, um, safe handling, good environment, that, all those kinds of things like that, which are not very glamorous, but are really important. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Well, um, I, I think quite a number of them used it. Um, and I don't know if all, some of you who have not worked in pastel may not know that something called fixative is typically applied in a spray. It's a, these days it could be an acrylic resin, and it's a, basically a sticky material which you spray, which helps par particles stick to themselves and, in a, in a sense, ensure that they stay put where you put them. And you're right that if you apply uh, a fixative to pastel in significant amounts, it in effect surrounds all the pigment particles with that resin, and that's just an optical change will occur. Now, you may, in your working methodology, knowing that, adapt to it in the sense that if you know that's going to happen, and sometimes I find with some of the lighter colors, they tend to even become a little more transparent. Uh, but the key, I think, is understanding what will happen and then making adjustments in your technique to either possibly work over it again, and, but also moderate the amount of fixative you use. It's a judgment call, I think. With the Degas, the amazing red uh, dancers in rows I'm showing you, that pastel is uh, has so much fixative in it, more so than any pa any painting I've ever seen in my life. Except there are a few places here and there where he added pastel on top, probably because he wanted to give an unfixed look to certain little touches here and there. But I'm a big advocate of using fi fixative if you learn how to use it, um, and if you use the proper kind of proper material. Uh, And Degas, you know, there's been a lot of ink spilled on what Degas might have used. He talks in his letters about having a friend, Kioliva, who's a chemist, having told him about a kind of fixative that he says is just fabulous. He doesn't say what it is. <laughs> so, yeah, maddening. Uh, but a lot of people have tried to ferret this out. One theory actually is that it uh, could be... Um, uh, something called uh, casein, a casein fixative dissolved in alcohol. Uh, Ralph Mayer's handbook, artist's handbook, tells you how to go about making it. But you don't have to do that these days. Uh, there's a company that's actually started making it They're called Spectrafix, I think. And, you know, it's, it has its own interesting working properties. And you, like any material, you have to kind of get to know what its properties are and how they work, and then use them to your advantage. Uh, but others have suggested that he might have used something like uh, cellulose nitrate, which was coming into use for lots of things. It was used for billiard balls, uh, stays and collars, all sorts of things. Uh, but also, unfortunately, for uh, uh, so-called nitrate films and it's well known not to be very stable. Nevertheless, one company, uh, Borden Chemical Company, produces Krylon artist fixative still using nitrocellulose, cellulose nitrate. I actually talked to a chemist there years and years ago, and I said, you know, we've done some analysis of the fixative, 
and we find that it's cellulose nitrate. Uh, he said, yes. I said, well, aren't you concerned? It doesn't have very good aging properties. And he said, well, we've never gotten any co uh, complaints. <laughs> I said, but you're also you're labeling the, the can artist fixative. Don't, I mean, don't you think that should count for something? And again, he just said, well, we just have never gotten any complaints. Goodbye. <laughs> OK. So I wouldn't, I, I would go out on a limb and say I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Gene, yes. Surfaces? Yes. 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 Yeah, it looks like. Yeah. Do we know that had an Nobody, to my knowledge, has done any research on how they made sanded papers in Mary Cassatt's day. Yeah. I mean, you know, some young, energetic young conservator might do the research project on that. Oh, it's a great project. Yeah, yeah. And my other question is, for those who painted on canvas, yeah. they must have mounted the canvas onto some project because it wouldn't have worked to try to paint the pastel if it moved. You know? Oh, yeah. It would have been first, well, it certainly would have been first stretched. Uh -huh. But actually, depending on the softness of the pastel, you know, try it. On a canvas? Yeah. On a yeah. stretched canvas? Yeah, a stretched canvas. Well, I don't know. <laughs> However, I do know, you know, I showed you a picture of one of the Manets that's in the show, a portrait of Mezois. Uh, up at the, uh, what's it called, the Shelburne Museum in Vermont. Yeah. Um, they actually have another Manet pastel done on canvas. They cannot exhibit it because it is so fragile, the pastel is literally flaking off so badly that it simply lives in a drawer flat. Very sad. It's just a document now. So I don't mean to say I'd recommend that, um, but you know the, that those pieces by Fritz Thalo, boy, they look great. And I haven't determined whether he actually used a fixative on them as well. Uh, uh, they, they're stretched canvas. Yeah, stretched canvas. Yeah, yeah. How about that? Well, you know, think about this too. In the 18th century, people like uh, John Singleton Copley, for example, worked on uh, uh, often on blue paper as the support for his pastels. But those pieces of paper were first affixed, probably pasted, to canvas, stretched canvas. Yeah, or it, I think it was probably stretched. The stretcher, stretch canvas was put on its uh, stretcher, and then a piece of this blue paper was affixed to it. And then he worked on that. So that, I think, would even be more likely to uh, move and so forth. Yeah, it's a little scary to think about. But the fact is, he did it. Yeah. So that's interesting to know. Yeah. Any, anybody else have any questions other than how much cheese is there left? <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. Uh, the question, just so we make sure everybody heard it, did they use spacers to keep the glass from coming in contact with, uh, with the uh, pastel? Uh, sometimes, yes. Uh, all of the Millet pastels uh, were matted actually had mounts put around them to allow a little bit of space between the pastel and the uh, glass. But they were also glued around their edges to a sheet of paper, which in turn was attached to cardboard. So that in effect, the sheet of paper that, that uh, Millet was working on was stretched also just and to hold it flat. It was a, a very common technique used, I especially know of the French having done this a lot, uh, and it kept everything nice and flat. Under those circumstances, when you have a very flat picture, uh, there's much less chance that it's going to come in contact with the glass. 
today, if that picture, the paper you're working on is not stretched, yeah, you'd probably have to have some sort of spacer in there, maybe a substantial spacer. But uh, these, these things I brought along, for example, are on boards, they're panels. The kind of thing Gene was talking about a minute ago, uh, you can get sanded surfaced boards these days, which are wonderfully flat. So then all you need is a modest amount of space between the pastel and the glass, which is a, a real boon for people in doing pastels. Does that answer your question, Anne? Because, uh, but today there are quite a few artists who are putting the glass directly onto the pastel painting. Uh -huh. And I was wondering how you yeah. would say conservation of space and uh, I think I'd say it's a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in fact, when you're saying that, I, I remember a big project we got involved with a number of years ago to systematically try to go through every single American pastel in the Museum of Fine Arts collection. And boy, there were so many instances, probably about a, a third of them, where the pastel was directly against the glass. And when you carefully removed the glass, you could see a ghost image of the pastel. Now, you could say, well, did it matter? Well, actually, you look at the pastel, there's still a lot there. And, you, you know, I couldn't have been you know, doing a, a test where you'd say, well, has any pastel been lost or not? I couldn't have tell, told you that. But it's obvious that some was lost. So I think that's really not a good idea. Well, yeah, although again, maybe methodology, maybe Jean will talk about this in her workshop in February. Uh, you know, knowing that some of the pastel is not going to be perfectly attached as you finish it. Sometimes if you, uh, you do nature a favor and just simply tap it on something to begin with to try to get all the weak particles off, as it were, uh, and then after that, if you're adept at using just enough fixative to help hold things in place, chances are pretty good that they'll, it'll stay in place. I wouldn't want to drop kick it across the room, but you know. <laughs> well, have we reached the end of questions? Yeah, but not the end of cheese. So if anybody wants anything. <laughs> Thank you.